Hello, good evening. Um, nice to see a, a few people out tonight anyway, given that it was uh, August, we weren't sure how many might actually show up. So um, we're going to be talking tonight about a topic that is at one level becoming quite fashionable. You'll probably be hearing more about this whole area, uh, a lot more I imagine in the coming months and, and years. But in fact, what we're looking at tonight has been the subject of many decades of research. So just to please bear that in mind, this may appear to be a new and trendy form of, of work, but actually from the point of view of therapy and, and work that we do with people with anxiety and depression, we've probably just gotten better at honing it in a variety of ways. Now to start with, you may be wondering, what am I doing with a picture of Beauty and the Beast up there? Well, I suppose in some ways I thought I wanted to subtitle my talk as Beauty or the Beast. And I want you to consider the idea that when it comes to your mental health, there are elements of choice. And one of those choices is the way in which you may talk to yourself in response to a variety of different situations you find yourself in. And that choice may come down to you being either critical of yourself or being compassionate. So tonight I'm going to be looking at the role of compassion and compassion-focused therapy in the treatment of anxiety and in eating disorders and what role does it have to play even in its onset or maintenance. We've a lot to thank this gentleman here for, Professor Paul Gilbert. Um, he founded the whole area of compassion-focused therapy back in around 2000. And what he observed in the work he was doing with people was that many of the people he was seeing, although they understood the principles involved in trying to challenge their negative thinking, somehow it just wasn't getting through. And what he found particularly was that people who had very, what, what he called, who were high in shame or self-critical out of the time, found it very, very hard to begin to think well of themselves or to generate what we call a self-soothing voice. And that was kind of the start of it. Um, now, uh, Paul is very much an academic, and if you're interested in that kind of area and you want to look at it from an academic perspective, these are a couple of his books that I would recommend. Um, they're available on Amazon. Um, the, the, this one here is probably the Compassion Focus Therapy, is the shorter one, um, and it's a nice little primer. Um, and this one here has a lot more around the, the research uh, behind the development of Compassion Focus Therapy. So if you're on the academic side, they're probably good ones to, to look at. Um, there are, are some other recommendations I'm going to be making um, as we go on this evening. But just before we go any further, I'd like you to stop, take a moment, and just breathe. I don't know what kind of day you've had. I don't know how much of a struggle you had to get here. Maybe you had a short walk, maybe you had a long journey. But sometimes what's important is that we just stop and take a moment. So I'm just not going to speak for the next 20, 30 seconds, and I'd just like you just to stop and let your mind flow. You can close your eyes or leave them open. There'll be no surprises. Let's just breathe. Okay. I want to begin uh, with a bit of a news flash, and I'm kind of going slightly off topic in some ways, but not in others. And um, I, I suppose I have a little concern in sharing with you what I'm about to share, because this may be all you'll remember from this lecture tonight. Um, and so if so, I apologize in advance, because this really is, um, it's a bit of shocking news from the world of fashion. Now, you know, we're, we're used to 
some pretty shocking news from time to time when we look at the world of fashion, the kind of treatment of, of models, um, the, the way that they're you know, forced in, in many ways to live very harsh and difficult lifestyles. Of course, some of them you know, get paid an awful lot of money for it, but at the same time, we're used to just hearing shocks about them having to be extremely thin and be literally just um, like a hanger for clothes. Um, but I want to talk to you about the world of camels, strangely enough, and in particular, I want to take you to uh, think about a camel beauty contest. Now, you may not have heard about this, but um, in Saudi Arabia, at the beginning of every year, there's a month-long camel festival. And more than 300,000 people attend this festival every single year. And they have a beauty contest for the camels. You can see it here. It's Miss Camel 2018. Uh, you, can, you can see the uh, happy recipient of the, of the prize. Um, now, the shocking news from this year's festival was this. 12 camels were disqualified because their handlers or owners used Botox to make them look more <laughs> handsome. <laughs> you know, sometimes you think you've heard it all. And uh, it's like, you know, what, I, I don't know what to say to that, but it's just, when I came across it, I just thought, wow, this is, you know, it's a strange world that we, we live in sometimes. Anyway, on to something more serious. So the kind of areas I'm going to be looking at tonight, I want to look at the context for compassion and why we all need it in our lives. Secondly, we're going to look and explore about what is compassion, more particularly what is self-compassion, and then I'm going to be looking at the context within which this arises in anxiety and depression. I'll be quoting some research in, in this area. I'll also be giving you a little bit of work to do. So, um, I, you know, just to bear that in mind, you'll be getting some questions to think about. You don't have to give me your answers, but just something for you to reflect on yourself as well. And if you're interested uh, in compassion websites, if you want to read up more about them, there are three compassion websites I've mentioned here, um, self-compassion.org, the compassionateinstitute.com, and compassionateliving.info. And if you're a Twitterer, if you are a tweeter, not sure really what quite the term is, um, if you hashtag 365 days of compassion, um, you'll see one of the people I'll be quoting a, a fair bit tonight, uh, Dr. Mary Welford. Uh, she is, and our colleagues have set up this on a Twitter account and really worthwhile following. Every single day they post something about compassion, uh, something very encouraging. So again, just something to, to bear in mind. Um, and again, just these all will be available on the website and uh, when the uh, video is released on the AWARE website as well. These are some books that I'd recommend that are really, really good. Um, the first two here um, are by Dr. Mary Welford. She's an English psychologist who has done a huge amount of work in this area with Paul Gilbert over the last 15 years or so. Um, and she, she's an excellent teacher if you ever get a chance to see her. Um, I believe she's actually coming to Dublin later this year. Um, but both these books are very good if you're thinking about something in terms of self-help for building confidence or if you want to use the Compassion Focused Therapy, one for dummies, as they, as they call them. Um, they contain some really great exercises. And then uh, there's an American colleague, Kristen Neff, who has written extensively and researched this extensively as well. And I would recommend uh, each of these books. They, they all have very good uh, things in them in, in their own right. But it's maybe something for you to consider. Again, these will be on the, the website for those of you who are interested. So if we think about life for a moment, your plan in life probably looks something like this. This is the kind of trajectory that you'd like it to go in. But the reality for many of us is that it kind of probably looks something more like this. And I suppose from a mental health perspective, the challenge is how do you negotiate your way and traverse your way through the times when things are very difficult and when things are very, very challenging in order for you to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. And in this context, I want to just look at why do we need compassion? Well, I think the first thing is we've all got to acknowledge that life is hard. No matter what way you look at it, 
There are things in life that we just cannot avoid. And even if all our hierarchy of needs, as, as Maslow would have seen it, are met, if we've access to food, to shelter, to warmth, if we've got education, a place to put our head at night, people around us, that doesn't change a number of realities that we all have to face in life. And by the way, I'm just warning you in advance, you may be thoroughly depressed by the end of this particular slide, but um, I'm just warning you in, in advance. We all have to face pain and difficulties in our lives, no matter who we are. We all get sick. We all grow old and we all die. We all lose people we love. We all fail and mess up from time to time when we just don't get things right and we regret the things that we could have done differently. We all have our hearts broken, sometimes, several times, during our lifetime. And the price, I suppose, of admission to life is that it can be hard for all of us. And so in that context, given the reality that there are things like this we cannot avoid in our life, we need compassion. But before we go to the road of compassion, we've got to recognize the reality that we, need, we, we have to deal with emotions because all of these situations generate a whole variety of emotions. And these are a normal part of our everyday lives from the moment we wake up through to the moment we sleep and even then we can still be caught up in very emotional dreams that can be very challenging sometimes for us to deal with. Um, and these characters here, I don't know if you've seen the movie Inside Out, um, ostensibly it was a children's movie but I would honestly recommend this movie to every adult uh, because it is one of the best movies I've ever seen um, uh, that, and although it is animated etc um, you've got this character here who's Joy who's at the center of it and um, Joy is, spends a lot of her time trying to keep this lady at bay who's sadness and she keeps on trying to put sadness in her place and not let her touch too many things because whenever sadness touches something, everything just gets, well, really sad and everything slows down. And then she's got to contend with anxiety and anger who's just ready to blow at the slightest thing going wrong. And in the movie, uh, joy and sadness through a combination of mistakes end up getting lost in the subconscious and fear, anger, and disgust, I left her out there, are left in charge, and all hell breaks loose. And it's a great story about the journey back and understanding the context within which emotions are important for us in our lives. So I'd really heartily recommend that if you can get hold of it. So emotions then tend to be very helpful to us sometimes, but also they can be quite challenging. First of all, emotions do guide us towards our goals. If we don't feel strongly about something, we're hardly likely to really want to go after it. Secondly, emotions very often have a focus on threat and on our self-protection. If you hear a loud noise, if someone says something to you that suggests that there's a threat to you in the future, well then, that, that's what will, will often come about. There will be an emotion that goes with that. And also our emotions focus on our need for success, for achievement, and there's a drive that has to go with that as well. And then finally, which we're going to be looking a lot at tonight, is the focus on contentment and feelings of safety, what we call self-soothing. And when our emotions arise, we need to be able to effectively deal with them by being good in, uh, better in this area. And just to give you a, a diagrammatic representation of what that looks like, what I want you to consider are these three areas or systems that we all have. Now the most common one that we're often conscious of is this threat system. And that is always about protecting us. A part of our brain, as it says there, called the amygdala, which spends a lot of its time being aware of possible threats to us, whether real or imagined. And the amygdala is always on, always looking for a potential threat that may be there. And in order for that to be able not to get too big, we need to rely on our soothing system. 
um, and that is where we tell ourselves everything's going to be okay, things will work out well. And on the other side, we've got our drive system. And the purpose here is to motivate us to achieve in our lifetime. Now, emotion regulation is important because whenever we have a very strong emotion, we have to know, what can I do with this strong emotional experience? Do I try and bury it? Do I try and allow myself to experience it? But the reality is sometimes emotions can feel very overwhelming for us. And so as a consequence, we can feel things like guilt, we can feel sad, we can feel very frustrated, we may feel various degrees of anger, we may blame ourselves when things don't work out for us, and indeed we may end up feeling often that we've low self-worth when compared to other people. And what happens then in your system is that there's an urge, there's a drive to do something that's going to make me feel better. Because whatever you want, you want to feel better in that moment. We don't generally like holding on to very strong emotions for too long. Now, your old brain, as we call it, is very threat focused. And the old brain um, thinks that threats are everywhere. Now, back in the day when we lived in caves and places like that, that probably was true because the reality is that we were stuck in situations whereby you could walk into a cave and find that there's a lion or a bear in there or something like that. So you had to be able to get out pretty smartish or there might be a guy ready there to throw a spear at you and you had to be either able to, well, throw a spear back at him or run very, very fast. And I suppose in this way, our, although our brains have developed a lot, in other ways they haven't because we are still at times very threat focused. And in many species, even from birth, they have to be able to go it alone, much like these baby turtles who have about maybe 20, 30 seconds from the time that they are hatched to get to the water quickly before they're devoured by something that is just waiting for them as a tasty morsel for their supper that evening. And so survival in early days depended upon our ability to be able to be very successful in detecting and evading these kinds of threats. And we can often experience that, as I said, even in ordinary situations every day, although there may not be an obvious threat, we may tell ourselves that there's going to be a threat and so therefore we will feel anxious, we may feel distressed because we anticipate that something bad is going to happen. If any of you ever watched the movie Jaws, um, you know, the opening sequence from that movie uh, is one that you know, many people can still remember to this day, those of you who are old enough to remember when it first came out, like myself. Um, you know, just all you had to do was hear the music and you knew what was coming. What was that silly girl doing in the water at midnight? So in order to cope with threats, in order to cope with very strong emotion, we need to have a balanced mind. Now, if our mind is not balanced in the right kind of way, we can develop over time a whole series of unhealthy responses to stress. So we may just constantly get angry, we may go around feeling fearful all the time, or we may equally spend a lot of time running ourselves down with our internal self-talk. And that's saying things like, I can't do it, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not perfect, um, I not, can't make a mistake, things like that. And these are not the best ways to deal with stress when they arise. And what happens when we can't regulate our emotions? Well, one researcher has put it like this. When we're unable to effectively regulate our emotions, especially threat-based emotion, including shame, through a well-developed soothing system, we can often resort to an over-reliance on the drive system, where we develop an inflated need to strive, achieve, succeed, and accomplish things. And we experience that for many people we know will try and succeed because they don't know how else to achieve a self-soothing. And that can be from a student who all the time has to get 100% in an exam or at least as close to it as possible. 
uh, and if they don't, then they can berate themselves quite a lot. And even if they do, they're very quickly thinking about moving on to the next subject or the next topic. And in the context of shame, I'd recommend that you, uh, if you've watched TED Talks at all, um, it's just www.ted.com, um, I'd recommend watching this lady, Brené Brown. Uh, she's given two really good talks on vulnerability and shame that are really excellent. But a couple of quotes from her talk. She said, shame needs three things to grow exponentially in our lives. It needs secrecy, it needs silence, and it needs judgment. And most people who experience shame, and let's face it, and there are situations where we all have experienced that in our lives to a greater or lesser extent, will know that, that that's the challenge, that you, know, you feel you've got to keep it secret, you've got to stay quiet about it, because you're terribly fearful of the judgment of what happens if this is revealed. And as she said, shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we're capable of change. And when people have very strong shame experiences, they become often quite paralyzed because they don't believe they can do anything to change their circumstances or their situation. And interestingly, Brené Brown in her work in this area has said that where perfectionism exists, shame is always lurking. And that's an interesting statement, the idea that when we're trying to be perfect at something, actually, maybe there's shame underlying that. That's quite a complex idea. But as I said, if you watch your talk, really is well worth having a look at. To quote a couple of other people in this area, um, this is Hannah Gadsby, and uh, she is an Australian comedian. She's gay, and she, a lot of her comedy is around being gay and what it's like to be gay and her experiences of that. And she's just recently done a program on Netflix called Nanette. Um, it is a very, very powerful program. In fact, it is one of the most powerful stand-up routines I've ever seen. Because it starts off by you, uh, and a bit of a spoiler alert here, where you think you're watching a comedy routine from a very skilled comedian. And you are for about 20 minutes. And then she begins to introduce things like shame and her experiences of it. And she said, you should never soak anybody in shame. The prolonged existence of shame can flip over into destructive rage. And we can't exist in that. She said, it's like treacle. And she has had some very powerful shame-based experiences that she has t uh, now come out and talked about, which have led her to decide to change the way that she actually does her comedy partly because she realized that in doing the comedy routines that she does, she was ending up in a very self-deprecating situation. And as she said, most comedians do this. They constantly run themselves down in one way or another. So back here to the drive system, the soothing system, and the threat system. So we've looked at the threat of shame there for a moment. But I want you to consider, let's go back to the drive system. What happens if your soothing system gets knocked out or if it's just not powerful enough for you to be able to deal with what goes on? Well, very often, as I said a few moments ago, what happens then is that it's the drive system that takes over where you want to achieve in order to feel good about yourself or about your life. And that can often lead to a very clear focus on self-esteem, on doing things to try and build that up. Now, the thing about self-esteem and, you know, psychologists and people who've worked in the mental health area have for years banged on and on about building your self-esteem. And, you know, in recent times, we've begun to rethink this because we're not quite so sure that constantly trying to build up your self-esteem is the best way forward. And partly that's because in order to feel good about myself, I have to make a judgment that I'm a good, valuable person. And depending upon the circumstance you find yourself in, I've got to then compare myself to others and think at some level that I'm better than them and that's the only way that I can possibly feel good about myself. So it's a kind of a tricky situation. And sometimes trying to achieve self-esteem 
can come at a very high cost. And let me give you an example. Because what if things don't go well or things don't work out when you're trying to strive? What if you fail that exam that you've worked so hard for? What if you've put your money into a particular area and suddenly it vanishes for some reason that has nothing to do with you? And I want to start by asking you to consider these concepts here. Back in 1996, Nike had a strap line for their ad campaign just before the Olympics began. Second place is for losers. Now over the years I've seen quite a number of athletes and they've quoted this to me time and again, that this is what motivates them. This is what their coaches tell them. Second place is for losers. And like here, second place is the first loser. Only glory matters. These are the kinds of things that often people who try to achieve in the sports and athletic fields use to motivate themselves. But what's wrong with silver? Well, here's our Irish hockey team there at the weekend, our ladies who did us proud. Not a whole lot wrong with silver under those circumstances. Equally, Annalise Murphy, uh, who got a silver medal in the last Olympics, not a whole lot wrong with silver there. You can see her smiling face. And of course, let's not forget the O'Donovan brothers and their famous statement, you know, how did you do it, guys? Pull like a dog. And again, you can see they're very proud of their silver medals. But I want to tell you a story from 1996 and those Olympics. Now, you'll recall Michelle Smith, an Irish swimmer, won three gold medals and a bronze. I'm not interested in the controversy that surrounds that. What I want to talk to you about tonight is this lady here. This is Alison Wagner. And this is Alison Wagner receiving her silver medal. Contrast that face, that picture, with the smiles, that when the radiance we've seen on the faces of the others whom I've just shown you. Now at 19 years of age, can you just imagine for a moment, you've won a silver medal in the Olympics. How cool is that? Alison Wagner was one of the premier swimmers of her day. And most swimmers at that age, if they've done that well, they'll probably go on to you know, the next Olympics and maybe two, possibly even three more Olympics in them because that's the way swimmers are able to mature over time. The reality for Alison Wagner is that after these Olympics, she never swam again competitively. Within a year, she was being treated in a psychiatric hospital in America for anxiety, depression, low self-esteem and anorexia. And it took her years to recover. Now writing about it subsequently, here's what she had to say. She said, I was living in a warped situation. Now here's the striving bit, guys, in that if I didn't win two gold medals, in world record time, I was an absolute and complete failure. I blamed myself for not performing, that I'd buckled under the pressure. My whole life, my whole self-worth rested on those two swims. Now talk about pressure. And that's the kind of challenge that people can face if they put themselves under the wrong kind of pressure and they only end up with a silver medal in the Olympics. And if you're interested, this is Alison Wagner today, um, looking much, much happier. She has recovered very, very well. Um, she's a very good speaker uh, and writer and uh, is very well engaged with, with life. So the, the story does end happily, just in case you're wondering whatever happened to her. Again, you can check out her, her story, if you like, on the web. And I suppose I sometimes wonder that when we think about the Olympics, um, you know, there's the, the world of the Olympics is it's got to be faster, higher, stronger. And, you know, sometimes I think just maybe doing it maybe a little bit more slowly, going a little bit deeper and being a little bit wiser is probably a better way to go. 
Now, when we look at self-esteem and self-compassion then, what we've got to bear in mind is that there's a cultural norm that in order to be happy and healthy, I've got to have high self-esteem. But what's interesting is that bullies often appear to have high self-esteem, and the way they do it is they pick on people whom they deem to be weaker than themselves, because that's an easy way to boost your self-image. You say something bad about the other guy. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know how that possibly got in there. <laughs> um, or think about this for a moment. Some of you may have seen this uh, movie Rain Man, uh, brilliantly played by Dustin Hoffman. Um, what's interesting about the research around drivers, for example, is that 90% of drivers think that they're more skilled than other road users, even after they've caused an accident. They still believe that they're superior drivers. So somewhere in there, their self-esteem is pretty high. And it is interesting that the majority of people, I don't know if you want to nod your heads here or not, but uh, you know, probably here probably think that they're better than average drivers. I do. Anyway. So what are healthy responses to stress? Well, the good things to do are sometimes very simple. Talk to a friend. Do some exercise, sweat it out. Sometimes we just feel better by getting it out that way. Um, you might write in a journal. You might notice that you're under a lot of pressure, that you need a break, and you actually take it. You might do some meditation. You might get some sleep. Or you might do something soothing. Take a bath, listen to music, etc. At a personal level, other ways you can do that for yourself are being more attentive and tuned in to the fact that you're stressed and try and think about the um, thoughts that you've got and reflect on the emotional experience that occur around those sorts of times. And then you may be more self-compassionate, which is having a more positive and caring attitude toward yourself, even though you may have experienced some kind of failure. And so I want now to look at what compassion is and self-compassion, and what do these look like? And why are they so important? Compassion is quite a complex and sometimes controversial construct. But actually, it represents nowadays part of a growing global movement. And we recognize now the field of uh, the role of compassion in many, many different fields. And if you want to look at the Charter for Compassion.org website, you'll see that there. But it's uh, recognizing how important compassion is in health, um, in, in generally speaking, in our welfare, in education, and in lots of areas of our lives. When you look at pictures like this, what happens? Hopefully, you develop some kind of openness to the suffering of yourself and for others, because that's what compassion is. But this has to be linked to some commitment and a motivation to try and do something to reduce and alleviate that suffering. And that pretty much sums it up, that when we see images like this on our screen, which can be quite distressing or quite difficult to contemplate, or if we see someone falling over or something bad happening to somebody, we are generally speaking motivated to help and do something about that. And in this context, we look at compassion from three different perspectives. And we see there, there are three types. Now, the first one is fairly easy for most people to figure out. This is the compassion that flows out from you to other people. So that when you see images like this, maybe on TV, or you see someone suffering, something in you is stirred to do something about it. You engage with that, you identify at some level with it, and you want to do something about it. Majority of people have little difficulty with that. The second one becomes a little bit more tricky for many people. And this is what we call compassion flowing inwards. In other words, how do you respond to the kindness of other people toward you? When other people are nice to you, how do you deal with it? And that can be a little bit more tricky because now attention's been drawn to you and something kind or nice is being said to you. 
And I think there's a very classic Irish response sometimes in this kind of situation, which is to kind of shrug it off and deflect it away from yourself. So, you know, many women have told me that their reaction, for example, when they have something nice on that they're wearing and they're complimented for it, their reaction is, oh, this thing, uh, yeah, bought it in pennies. You know, and it's the, it's the yes pennies sort of syndrome that, that you hear from people. Um, that you don't say you got it in, heaven forfend, somewhere like Brown Thomas or something like that. Um, but instead, you try and deflect it away from you as if, no, 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 please don't, don't look at me. Or as one woman put it to me one time, she said, I can cope with someone saying, that dress looks well on you, but I can't cope with someone saying, you look great in that dress. And although it was a very subtle shift, she said, if the focus was on the dress, that's okay, but if the focus is on me, uh, no, that, that becomes a little bit more difficult. And then the third and more challenging compassion uh, level that we have to contend with and work with um, is the compassion toward yourself. When you're in a tricky situation, when uh, you're finding things hard, what are your own thoughts and feelings and experiences? What do you say to yourself? And this is the one that people struggle with most. And I'll talk a little bit later on about why that might be. So self-compassion, um, Krista Neff says, is being touched by and open to my own suffering. In other words, I pay attention to the fact that right now, whatever I'm experiencing, it's hard, it's not easy. And I have a desire to do something about it that is positive, that is going to help me to do that, but I'm going to, whatever way I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it with kindness. And I will learn how or challenge myself to be kind to myself. And this involves then being non judgmental, understanding your own pain, understanding that, like all human beings, you have your inadequacies, that you have your failures, but you don't have to feel ashamed of those but your experience is seen as part of that larger human experience. And the philosophy behind it is fairly simple. All humans deserve compassion and understanding, and not because you possess a particular talent or ability or desirable trait, but simply just because you're human. And yet, I suppose I'm aware of in this context, that, you know, when children are very, very small, when, you know, uh, babies are born and they're, they're being shown around, if you like, um, by, by parents to others, um, most people have no difficulty and most parents have no difficulty in really praising the child and saying wonderful things, isn't he gorgeous, isn't she beautiful, lovely baby, etc., etc. Now, if you're to work into the world of self-esteem, Actually, you'd probably be tempted to say something like, but that child has done nothing to deserve anything like that. Now, you'd probably be shot for it or run out of town. Um, but in the world of self-esteem, that's the way you judge it. That kid has done nothing to deserve all these nice things. And the reality is that by that time, that child is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That child has now entered the world where he or she can only feel good about him or herself if he is clever enough, if he or she is sporting enough, if you're pretty enough, if you're clever enough. And now it's a world of comparison. And it's a dangerous world. But with self-compassion, you don't have to feel better than others in order to feel good about yourself. Because with self-compassion, it allows you to fail, to get it wrong sometimes, to mess up. And you do that and you acknowledge that with kindness and you don't need to be ashamed you don't need to keep that hidden and it's not dependent upon external circumstances either and compassion and self-compassion is always available to you especially when you fall flat on your face so there are three components that we look at that we try and teach people when we're looking at teaching self-compassion the first is self-kindness, extending kindness and understanding to yourself whenever something bad happens. Secondly, you recognize you're human, what we call common humanity. 
Your experience is no different to the majority of other people. And you're just like others. Things don't always work out for you. And thirdly, thirdly, you are more mindful. So you're able to learn how to hold painful thoughts and experiences and feelings in awareness without feeling the need to over-identify them with them or to deal with them in an exaggerated manner. I'll be talking a little bit more about these just to give you some examples of what that looks like in a few moments. So what are the links then with depression and anxiety? I've spent a lot of time talking and just leading up to this point and you've been very, very patient. There's a good chance if you suffer with depression or anxiety, the research tells us, that you're not very kind to yourself. And statements and thoughts like this can run through your head. Feeling disconnected, feeling lost, feeling weak, trapped, lonely, helpless, worried about you'll make a fool of yourself, not feeling you're not like others, everyone else out there is doing better than I am. You know, I was talking to a lady only this morning um, who is wondering about coming off her medication because she said, I want to be like others. And I said, you know, when you make that statement, that's a very isolating statement. You make it sound like you're the only one who's on medication in this country or in this city. And we had a bit of a laugh about that and she says, yeah, you're right. You know, I'm just, you know, again, this was part of the isolation that she experiences. And going around calling yourself names doesn't really help a whole lot either. You know, you'll see Rodney here from Del Boy, you know, from uh, be, being told, you know, you're a plonker. And that's the mild end of some of the names that I've heard people call themselves. And maybe even that has been some of your own experience. And you know, the reality is, it can take a million compliments to build you up and a single insult to bring you down and make you feel like you're just a piece of dirt. And what I challenge you is not to do it at least to yourself. You may not be able to help what other people say, but you can at least help what you say to yourself. And now for something completely different, you may think. Anyone any idea who this lady is? And by the way, this was one of the more acceptable pictures that I could find of her on the internet. Anyone any idea? You don't watch enough uh, reality TV, you guys. Carmen Electra, very good, yes. Yes, you got that. This is Carmen Electra. Now, you think looking at this lady and, you know, she's been on, is it Pop Idol and those kinds of things or whatever the, the, uh, the programs are called. Um, you know, she's a multimillionaire. She's a very successful singer. Um, she is quite a beautiful individual. She's photographed in lots of different situations and circumstances. That here's someone who has it all. Well, here's something she said in an interview a couple of years ago. She said, when anything bad happens, my insecurities come flooding out. I look in the mirror and I pick at my flaws. I hate my stomach. It's impossible to get it flat. And that area around my belly button just drives me crazy. I'm sure looking at the picture, you know exactly what she's talking about. Uh, I have to say, I haven't a clue. But what I want to draw your attention to is just these words, okay? So that when anything bad happens, her instant response to that is to turn in on herself, to find a way to beat herself up, to pick at herself in the most damning way that many women can do that is going to make them feel bad about themselves. So what's the impact of self-criticism, what does the research say? Well, let's look at social phobia. Back in 2004, a study found that the highest levels of self-criticism were found uh, among people who had anxiety, among those with social anxiety and social phobia. In 2005, we began to see research coming out which showed that there was an awful lot of self-criticism that people experienced that led to negative social comparisons. 
How am I compared to other people? Am I achieving as well as somebody else? And that that often led, or was at least linked into, a vulnerability to depression. Now, there are lots of studies that we don't have time to go into tonight, but I want to bring you up to speed on some of the more recent work. And this is a report from the Journal of Abnormal Psychology last year. And this kind of study is probably the most important kind of research that you can carry out because it's longitudinal research. In other words, you look at people before the onset of any illness, before anything has started. And in this study, they, they had a look at the lives of 550 female adolescents. And here's what they found that self-criticism significantly predicted the first onset of nearly all depressive and anxiety disorders. In other words, depression and anxiety didn't come first, self-criticism came first. This for me is astounding research because it was a follow-up from an earlier study which looked at 276 young adolescents of both sexes. And this is really, really important because in terms of our work now with young people particularly, we know that the more likely that they are to engage in self-criticism from an early age, the more likely it is that this will predict the onset of anxiety and depression. Now, I'm not taking away from the fact that when we look at anxiety and depression, we have to examine them from what we call a biopsychosocial framework. In other words, there are biological factors, we, we know that. There are psychological factors you know, in terms of people's temperament, their, their, their learning experiences, and there are social factors in terms of the world that they live in. All of these have their part to play. But for me, this is very, very significant in terms of any therapy that we now conduct with young people particularly. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen for you either if you happen to suffer with anxiety or depression, to tune in to the degree to which you may be self-critical. And I would say this, no one, no one ever recovers from anxiety or depression by being self-critical. You can't beat yourself into getting better. So coming into the whole area of compassion then, I mentioned earlier on the work of Paul Gilbert and he said that those with chronic um, mental health problems um, are often troubled by shame, self-criticism, self-hatred and find it difficult to be open to the kindness of others. Now this last bit is really interesting because what they found was that when people were depressed and were anxious, when people were kind to them, they were, had a tendency to be dismissive of it because they didn't think they were worth it. So they pushed that kindness away, even when it was well-meaning or well-meant. Well and also we know that from some of the more recent research that self-compassion is actually a robust and important predictor of our psychological health. And here's what the recent research in this has to say, and this is a summary of some of the studies over the last number of years. First of all, we know that the higher you are in self-compassion, this is associated with better levels, generally speaking, of mental well-being, particularly if you find yourself in emotional distress. We now know that high levels of self-compassion are associated with positive mental health. People we know with high levels of self-compassion are happier, they're more optimistic, they feel more wise in their responses to situations, they're more curious about the world around them, and they have higher levels of emotional intelligence. Their physical health is better. They're, it's a better predictor of overall well-being than high self-esteem, interestingly. It protects them against emotional distress. It reduces burnout in workers when they have high self-compassion levels. And also, there are lower levels among these people of depression, anxiety and stress. So just a little exercise for a few moments to consider. And these are just a couple of questions. You don't have to obviously answer them now, but just to think about, again, I think these will be up on the website when this is posted online. But some questions I often put to people to consider and take away with them when we're exploring are run along these kind of lines. What sort of things would you typically tend to judge or criticize yourself for? 
your appearance, career, relationships, parenting, etc. And what type of language do you use when you notice a flaw or if you make a mistake? Like, do you, make, uh, do you insult yourself or are you kinder or, or not to yourself? And when you're being highly self-critical, how does this make you feel inside? So giving people a chance to focus in on the impact of self-criticism when, when they go through that. We also look at questions like this. When you notice something about yourself you don't like, do you tend to feel cut off from everybody, thinking, oh, everybody else is having a better time than I am? Or do you recognize, actually, I'm probably connected with my fellow human beings who equally um, are also imperfect. And what are the consequences of being hard on yourself? What happens when that occurs? Does it actually motivate you or do you end up feeling more discouraged or depressed? And finally, what would it be like if you could truly just accept, uh, love and accept yourself just as you are? And when we ask the question about does this scare people or give them hope, Often it's surprising how much it can actually scare people. So they're just some questions to consider. And they're actually on Kristen Neff's website. If you uh, look at her one, the selfcompassion.org one that I gave you earlier on. Now, some people worry that when we start talking about this whole area about self-compassion, that this is a big love fest. It's all about, I love me. I think I'm, I'm wonderful. And often, in fact, because of the mistaken beliefs around self, about self-compassion, it creates a lot of barriers. People worry about being selfish. Some people feel they're not deserving, as I said of it earlier on, and that's why they'll uh, not engage with it. Some people believe that if you're going to be kind to yourself, that that just means you're weak, you're, you're no good, you're not good enough, if you've got to be kind to yourself in order to feel okay. Some people worry it's going to make a personality change that somehow they're going to become big-headed or have a, what they call a swelled head and nobody likes people who are arrogant, etc, etc. And they become very fearful of that. But I can assure you it will not turn you uh, or make you into a lazy, selfish uh, in individual um, or turn you in, into an unbearable narcissist. There's no evidence that this happens if you learn to be self-compassionate. And this certainly isn't the kind of result that we usually see uh, from people being <laughs> self-compassionate, where their plan for the week is to be amazing, fabulous, uh, wonderful, extraordinary, etc., etc., and, and all of that. Um, and <laughs> there, goodness me, there he goes again. Nor will it turn you into anyone like this. So the primary goal then of the therapy around uh, cognitive, or, sorry, around compassion-focused therapy is fairly straightforward. We want to work with people to try and help them to improve their soothing system, as we call it, and learn to develop and activate this compassionate self. And this allows them to truly uh, do something that is truly healthy for themselves. So instead of listening to voices in their head that are constantly critical, they're learning to instead find kindness and uh, an understanding as a con in instead. And ways of toning that down at a practical level, well, first of all, when a feeling arises, the first thing you do is don't try and push it away. Let it be there. Accept the feeling for what it is without thinking that you've got to justify that feeling. You can say things like, look, it's not my fault that these feelings have arisen, but I need to take responsibility to learn how to manage them differently. So it doesn't let you off the hook. You see, the feelings are there, but you're still the one with the responsibility to do something about them. Recognize too, as I said earlier on, that others feel this way, and I'm not alone in the world. And recognize and challenge the self-criticism that may come in, and focus on self-compassion when stressed. And also we encourage people to try over time and recognise what we call ruminative cycles that they get into. Kind of movies that you play out in your mind where things don't turn out all, all that well, usually. So self-kindness then is about understanding, not punishment. And instead of mercilessly judging and criticising myself for my faults and failings, Instead, I can be kind and understanding because who said I'm supposed to be perfect? And if we look at it 
in terms of common humanity, it's recognizing like all humans, I experience suffering, I'm mortal, I'm vulnerable, and that's okay. I'm not alone. Um, and it's give yourself something to do, like I can talk to a friend. I don't have to be alone with this. And then just uh, coming up towards the end, um, well, I want to talk a little bit about mindfulness. Um, sometimes people think this is what their brain feels like, that there's just this stream of stuff that's just going in all the time that they're listening to in, in, in their head. I suppose the challenge about mindfulness is, are you being mindful or mindful? Um, so in other words, what is your mind actually full of? Is it full of all kinds of concerns and worries about all the things that have gone wrong or going to go wrong or that could happen? Or are you stopping to maybe just smell the daisies and uh, you know, relax and take it easy sometimes? Mindfulness, as described by John Kabat-Zinn, who's probably one of the gurus in, in this area, he said it means you're paying attention in a particular way on purpose. So you're just stopping in a given moment. You're staying in the present moment and you're doing so non-judgmentally. I was at a conference where he was speaking a number of years ago and someone asked him a question about, um, listen, what, what about you know, life after death? You know, are, you, are you not worried about like, you know, what happens to us beyond all of this? And he said, I'm not interested, he said. Uh, he said, what I'm really interested in, he said, is I hope we're going to have a nice lunch uh, when I'm finished my talk this afternoon. Because uh, he said, I'm hungry right now. So he was just focused on the present moment. And he said, that's how he lives his life. Um, his life is lived in the present moment. Now, that's not an easy trick. So it's a non, having a non-judgmental, receptive mind state where you're observing your thoughts and feelings. So in other words, you've got a little bit of distance from them. They're there, but you're not going to suppress or deny them. They're just there, and you're going to keep that little bit of distance. But recognize, too, that when it comes to mindfulness, and again, this is something there's an awful lot about out there in the media, about we all should be more mindful. At one level, whilst that's true, mindfulness is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And very often, it is important that people learn how to do it properly, because although many people like the idea of mindfulness, the actual practice of it can be a huge challenge and it can be quite complex. And this is just one example of the complexity of mindfulness. Uh, just for those of us working in the research area, this is what we call the Liverpool mindfulness model. And as you can see, there's a heck of a lot going on here and I don't have time to go through it all this evening. So mindfulness is learned. If you want to do it and do it properly, then choose a course. There are some very, very good courses out there. I know that the hospital here provides some very good courses as well. Buy a book about it. There are some excellent books out there about mindfulness. But learn how to do it properly. And mindfulness takes time, so be patient with yourself. Do it in small chunks. You may only do a small bit at a time. It may just be mindful about eating an apple. It may be reminding yourself that when you get up in the morning and you sit down to have breakfast, what would it be like not to have the news on, not to have a newspaper there, and more importantly, leave your mobile phone down, switched off or turned off, and just have your breakfast. What would that be like? Just do one thing in the moment and practice that. There are lots of different ways you can do that. As I said, it could be eating an apple, um, uh, there, there, it could be like having your breakfast, but just think about doing one thing in the moment. I'm conscious of a chap I, I knew who was working with people who were overweight in this context, and he asked this group of people in, and he gave them all a plate of food. All, they all got the same plate of food. And he said to them, I'd like you just to eat um, as much as you think you need. And he said, and, but, you know, try not to uh, you know, get, get too caught up in, uh, in you know, just, just try and just focus on feelings of fullness. Anyway, everybody ate everything on the plate. Plates were empty at the end of that. So we brought them back a week later, and he gave them the same plate of food. Only this time, he blindfolded them. And he said, 
Now eat what's on the plate and stop when you think you're full. Every single one of them left food on the plate, much to their surprise, because now they were being mindful of what was going on inside here rather than what was going on in their, in, in their, in their sight. There are also some very good apps um, around mindfulness as well. There's some very good ones. Uh, Headspace and Calm is the other one. Headspace, um, they, they, they charge you. Um, I mean, that, not to say it's not good. It's very, very good. But after the first seven days, uh, they do charge you. The other one called Calm was voted the app of the year by Apple uh, last year and is a very good one. has a lot more free stuff on it. And, um, you know, I'm always on for getting stuff that's free on the internet. How good is mindfulness? Well, here's the results of a research study carried out last year when they got a group of people to do 10 minutes of mindfulness. This is a PET scan study which measures the impact on the brain. In other words, how active is the brain? And you'll see the picture on the left here is just before. And the more red that there is and yellow, the more active the brain is. The more blue and green, the more relaxed the brain is. This was only after 10 minutes. You can see the result of that, how much the brain had actually calmed down. Now, this is great research because this kind of picture shows you it works. And here's the evidence for what it does to your brain. I started off by saying you had a choice and that there is an element of choice when it comes to compassion. And I want to leave the last few words with two of the people who have done a lot of the work in this area. Brené Brown says, compassion is not a virtue, it's a commitment. It's not something we have or don't have, it's something we choose to practice. And Mary Welford, in her book, uh, Compassion Focused Therapy for Dummies, says at the end of it, we are all the product of our experiences and our biology. However, we also have the unique capacity to intentionally stop, consider, and choose, and then act in a particular way. So she suggests maybe instead of constantly reacting to our internal and external world, we can proactively choose a compassionate response. I wish you all the best with your compassionate exercises. Thank you.